Cool. All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming to our talk uh, titled Scaling an Open Source Sponsorship Program. Uh, today we're going to be talking about just that, particularly in a corporate setting, um, sharing some lessons learned, some tactics from running our own open source program at Stripe, um, starting our own sponsorship program, and then pulling in some insights and lessons learned stories uh, from other companies that we've heard along the way. Um, I'm Mike Fix. I'm a software engineer at Stripe. Been working there for about four years now um, in various roles, and I also am the head of our virtual OSPO, our open source program office. Um, been running that for about three years as well now. Hey everyone, my name is Carol. I'm the technical program manager for a DevRel team at Stripe. I've worked there for almost three years now and kind of worked on a variety of things from like developer marketing, developer advocacy, now DevRel, um, but I've always been a part of our volunteer open source team. Um, just to give you like a little brief overview of what we're going to be talking about, we'll sort of start off just laying the stage for what the stages of a corporate open source project, a sponsorship program can look like, sort of based on our experience, a lot of our experience, and interviews with colleagues that we'll mention, uh, then sort of how you might kick off and launch something, how you might grow, but then what we'll really get into is the tactics for operating at scale both um, from our lessons learned and just sort of things that we wished we had done along the way or that we knew afterwards. And then we'll actually finish up with a little bit of sort of blue sky opportunities for where we hope slash dream open source sponsorship could go. If we have any questions, feel free to raise your hand at any point along the way for clarification, for just wondering where we're going with something. I think this is a decent enough group we could probably get through all that, but you can also come up afterwards. We are happy to chat. Yeah, so just uh, to lay the gro uh, ground work. Uh, what's the problem here? We all uh, know this very well. Um, the open source ecosystem needs further monetary investment uh, if we're going to sustain it in the long term. Um, this is the status quo. We all know this. And um, we talk a lot, a lot this week about sustainability in that. Um, and likewise, companies also now know that they want to invest in open source. Um, but it's just been difficult historically to pitch that throughout the company, managing upwards, managing outwards. Um, and so today we're gonna to talk about how to make uh, a truly sustainable open source sponsorship program. And by sustainable, what I mean is that in the ideal case, it doesn't go away no matter what happens. Um, so yeah, given the status quo is that many, many projects are in need of funding, uh, the first step is to come up with a set of principles by which you were going to navigate that wide slew of projects, narrowing it down to the ones that you can invest in um, and align that with a funding strategy. Um, so yeah, first step for establishing a sponsor program is coming up with a set of investment principles. You can think about this as uh, an investment thesis or something uh, if you're familiar with like venture capital. Um, for us, that was uh, a few things. For one, we wanted to be impact driven, so provide enough money to make a tangible impact on the maintainers' lives, um, since the ultimate goal is to keep the project running and growing. Um, we knew that investing too little in any one project would mean that was basically sort of like throwaway money, or it wouldn't make a meaningful enough impact for them to make a change in their life to dedicate more time or the right amount of time to their project. Um, Along that, uh, we want to be maintainers first. So uh, in picking that amount, we went and asked our initial maintainers, like, how much would, would make a meaningful impact in your life? Like, what's a good amount um, for investment month to month? Uh, and what we landed on for our initial pilot was $3,000 a month. Like, that would make a meaningful enough contribution so that they would be able to invest more time in the projects that they wanted to build themselves. Uh, and then, yeah, with that self-sustaining. So in the ideal case, none of our investments should end. Uh, they should be uh, reoccurring um, and return enough investment back to our company in a measurable way so that we can keep sponsoring every project on a month-to-month -month basis indefinitely in the ideal case. Um, yeah, these are, the set of, uh, these are the main principles by which we went about making our selections for an initial pilot. So yeah, that's how we went about uh, starting off the program. And so 
that was what setting the groundwork for eventually establishing our sponsorship program. Uh, the first stage of this is a pilot. This is all about testing a hypothesis, um, and then from there, set, launching multiple cohorts, cohorts one, two, three, and basically just repeating the process as you go, uh, and then setting the stage for ultimately creating a platform, a platform by which other teams within your company or organization can leverage open source to accomplish their own goals. That's the direction we wanted to head in. Um, so yeah, kicking off. Um, on day one, this is roughly three years ago at Stripe, uh, we were just thinking very altruistically, like looking outward and saying like, hey, our goal is to give money to the open source ecosystem. And when we went to our CTO, we said, hey, we wanna give money to our open source ecosystem. And he agreed, he was like, yeah, I wanna give money to the open source ecosystem too. And even with that alignment, it was you know not eight months from there is when we launched the initial pilot. So even when leadership and uh, folks on the ground are aligned, thinking just purely altruistically is difficult uh, in, a, in establishing a sponsorship program because at the end of the day, your boss has to pitch to their boss, has to pitch to their boss, uh, and they have to prove that they're doing right by the business. And so without uh, measurable ROI, it's very difficult to say like, hey, we just wanna do this out of the goodness of our hearts. Um, so after we hit a wall there, we went in the direction of being completely self-serving. So we looked internally and we're like, hey, like what are the most dependencies that we're using the most? Like doing all the regular scans that a lot of companies fall into, um, figuring out uh, which, which project we use the most, asking people like, hey, like what would you sponsor if uh, you could sponsor a project? And the pitfall we fall into there is that we end up in the trap of only sponsoring the most visible projects. And those projects already tend to get a lot of attention and sponsorship. So you end up uh, not being able to invest in the, in the projects that need it the most. Um, and, and, and that makes it more difficult to measure your impact. Uh, given that they're already saturated, uh, the dollars that you invest in those projects won't go as far. And so ultimately our third approach what we're calling the symbiotic approach. Um, we like to think about this as like a recursive approach, looking outward, but also looking inward, seeing how we can align our business needs with the needs of the maintainers in our community. Um, thinking about it this way, it's like self-reinforcing. So uh, if we can measure ROI, dollars coming back into our business, um, then we know that like, hey, if we're making more money from this investment than the money we're putting out, then we can continue to sustain projects on a reoccurring basis indefinitely, but it also is evidence to expand the program. If the first one went well and it made more money than we invested, then like it's just logical sense to do that in more cases throughout the business. And I tend to think of the, about this as dual power. Like we're existing in a world where we need to pitch upwards and prove our worth to the company, but while moving in the direction of that altruistic approach of simply giving money to open source because that is the right thing to do. Um, and then what this ends up leading to is funding the long tail of open source investment. Uh, so funding all those small projects that we know add up to the massive open source ecosystem that we're trying to support. Um, and yeah, taking this symbiotic approach ends up making it so that your dollars go further. Uh, and because it tends to be, by definition, uh, those projects are underinvested in, um, typically you can be the first sponsor in their project. Uh, and by being the first sponsor, they tend to uh, pay attention to, to you, not only from like the monetary standpoint, but building relationships, you can uh, impact roadmaps, or, and not just from a selfish perspective either. A lot of times they want to know feedback from their largest users uh, in order to build the features that uh, real users are relying upon. So yeah, with the, with the pilot, uh, it's all about testing a hypothesis. Uh, the first round is always based on a belief. And so once you've established those set of principles, uh, you can now go about picking some projects that align with those principles. Um, and bef with, besides principles, you wanna set like, what does success look like before launching the program? So establishing that with leadership and your executive sponsorship up front, uh, what does success look like? Because you know like before you run this program, you don't know what uh, how things are gonna go. So you wanna say, like set a, basically run this like the scientific method. 
like have a hypothesis, uh, figure out what success looks like, uh, and launch um, your first initial investments aligning with that. I want to say too that like before launching, try and have some sort of even if it's a best guess, even if it's an estimation, um, a measurable set of criteria is against that success. So for us, we had actual charts that measured U.S. dollars coming into our business and examined that against uh, the sponsorship amount that we gave for these projects. Now, it's easy because we're a payments company, so it's, it's a lot easier for us to, to do those sorts of measurements. Um, it's not always the same, but uh, we can talk, we'll talk more later about how you might measure cost savings or risk savings, that sort of thing. Um, and finally, like having this measurable ROI isn't just make it easy, doesn't make it just easy when things are going well. Uh, it's critical when things are going poorly. So in a uh, economic downturn, um, having that ROI to point to makes it simple to argue for keeping your program around. So uh, we know that like lots of companies have gone through layoffs in the last six months, uh, including our company as well. But despite that, our sponsorship program has remained strong, um, stable even, uh, <clears throat> because we've proven that the ROI is positive uh, throughout that time period. Uh, so once you have a model in place that's proven results, you know, with leadership buy-in, a mechanism for mapping out your decisions with that outcome, kind of the only thing left to do often is just to repeat that process with more projects, continuing again to measure each project against your success criteria. Yeah, so for Stripe, that meant adding new cohorts of projects whenever they met our investment criteria, our, our principles, uh, and our uh, sourcing criteria. For other companies, we've heard this meant like repeating that process on a monthly or quarterly basis. Uh, for us, we just did it whenever we found a cohort of projects that met that strict criteria, and we wanted to add them to the program because we knew that that would lead to positive ROI. Yeah, and for many programs, like many organizations, this is the extent of your program, which is totally okay. Just repeat a known process. You know, you iterate by tweaking for performance for every quarter indefinitely. You kind of wash, rinse, and repeat. And I'm curious, kind of, of you in the room, I'm assuming a lot of you are at OSPOs. Is that, yes, nods, great. Are you at the stage of having a sponsorship model? No, so we're kind of trying to start it up. Is anyone already at the point of having one? All right, we got some people, okay. So kind of what we're gonna go over next is to really talk about ways to scale a program to make it truly sustainable. But if you're kind of even just at the point of not even having gotten started yet, I would say, Think a lot about your investment principles. Think a lot about where you want to go with all of this because especially at a smaller company, you already kind of know that implicitly, but somewhere down the line, a CFO is going to ask you to make it explicit. And if you have that already, then you can say this is how everything has gone in that direction. So kind of next, we're going to talk about how to scale in an expansive way. So it's well positioned to kind of keep running as long as possible, sort of with or without you, which is kind of what we're hoping to talk about in terms of sustainability. So. We talked about testing your hypothesis, and one other possible way to do this is to expand within your company of other hypotheses that you could try out. So it's essentially thinking about what other pain points are there that OS sponsorship can ease. So if you're a developer product, dev tools, developer first company, like DX might be a big thing for you, and maybe that's owned by DevRel, maybe that's owned by a different team. Um, at Stripe, like developer experience is obviously something that we're always thinking about, and it's something that a lot of teams think about, so that's an easy one. Um, but if your company is maybe at a stage of needing to push product development to the next level or kind of do these like make it or break it deals for you to sort of like get to a point of having good numbers, like see if supporting an open source uh, project can meet those needs. And especially like if you hear your colleagues are being pushed for eng output, but they don't have the headcount. Can you essentially make an open source project an arm of your team? You'll notice when you look at all of these that potentially like support of the same project could serve many, all, or some of these business goals because the downstream impact of supporting one project can be huge. So which does your company think are worth it and thus which can you present in the best way to guarantee support for your program down the line? Yeah, so now we've been discussing a lot of things uh, broadly at this point, but we're going to start diving more into specific tactics for operating at this, this scaling point of a sponsorship program. Uh, a first example that for us 
led to this ability to scale was coming up with a sponsorship menu. So for ours, this meant establishing new models for investment that let other teams participate in our sponsorship program and wasn't uh, and sort of decentralized the process. So we started off with pillar one, uh, grow revenue. This was our measuring ROI based on uh, project growth that from the companies that from the projects that we're sponsoring in. And so we measured the ROI based on more dollars coming into our business. Um, but we also added a second pillar, which is saving costs. Uh, for us, this is a pilot. We're still exploring what ROI means in this realm. But for example, you can measure uh, how much AWS cost savings um, certain changes uh, lead to, and then can map that to like, hey, like how many like engineering hours do you think uh, improving this project will lead to? And you can sort of map estimated cost savings in that way. And in aggregate, if you say like, hey, like maybe I'm estimating saving 50 hours per month, um, then like sponsoring a project could be like one tenth of the estimated uh, ROI there. And so that even if it's a squishy number, uh, it could be worth it for your company to go down that, that route. And then finally, and what we've seen is like the most successful uh, pillar was actually just bring your own budget. Uh, now this was always a possibility, but just putting it on the menu, quote unquote, uh, led to a bunch of teams reaching out to us saying, hey, like we have these business goals and we want to sponsor these open source projects to build a relationship, to unblock certain uh, contracts even, uh, to move the needle in, in their org. And these are obviously hypotheses that we couldn't have come up with on our own in the open source team. Uh, but they came to us with that business need and we said like, hey, if you come to us with a need and a budget, we can execute on all of the uh, administrative burden of handling the open source sponsorship program, um, open source sponsorship of those projects, and they can le they can focus on uh, building the relationships with those maintainers. So this is what we th talk about when we call it like a platform. Uh, we're becoming like a product or platform for other teams across the company to leverage for their own needs. So one of our biggest challenges, and which honestly continues to be a big challenge, is how to scale the relationship management piece of this. Because ideally, you're not just auto-paying these maintainers every month and never talking to them. Like, you could. That's already a great goal. But you kind of really want to be able to have a relationship with them. And if you're trying to scale up a program, that can often be very difficult. So I'm just going to walk you through a little bit of the experience that we went through. And if you're still very early stage, like you might recognize some of these things. If you're at a later stage, it's good to know we're all having the same problems. So kind of phase one is often just that the person who pays them is the person who talks to them. That's just the default. It makes sense. Um, and you kind of, even if you have a rotating roster of maintainers that you're supporting, you still have that one person who's responsible for talking to them all. And this can totally work, but you can easily see how quickly this is not scalable or sustainable, and if that one person leaves, you lose all of those relationships. And I would say in our case, this didn't work out because we were already too big. So almost no one employee at Stripe knows the complexities of every single product out there. I say almost no because we have some very talented technical solutions engineers that I think would be astounding in how much they know. But for everyone else, this became a choke point because basically like somebody, a maintainer would like come talk to me, they'd ask me about something and I would have to try to figure out like, number one, what product are we even talking about? Uh, what team is that? Like how do I map this out to who I'm supposed to be talking to? And we were just kind of lacking the expertise or the buy-in from those teams to necessarily make these questions a priority. So sort of what we shifted to phase two in about, I think, 2021, was we brought them all into a program. And this was our equivalent of a champions program. We called it community developer experts. And in that case, they could reach out to multiple people that they knew, and they often knew a lot of people already. And it was often through a lot of varied channels, you know, Twitter, Twitter DMs, Discord, private channels, GitHub discussion forums. But as long as they reference, like, hey, I'm in this program, hopefully within Stripe, people would like funnel it to the right place. So in this sense, we took the burden off of one person triaging everything. Um, it allowed our maintainers to talk to us where they wanted to, because there was no one platform that everybody was on, even GitHub. Um, so we could kind of meet them where they are. And rather than like one person like me trying to find different teams, you kind of had different teams hopefully all funneling to the one place. And this actually I would say worked all right for a bit, probably about a year. 
at this stage though, I'd say one of the downsides was that we didn't have an actual like full developer CRM yet. So we often had a lot of people like comparing notes or not comparing notes about what was happening, like who had talked to who, and it was easy for things to fall between the cracks if one person forgot about something. So kind of what I would maybe call stage like 2B is as we grew, we wanted to try and see if we could give these maintainers some more personalized contact. So we still had the champions program running, um, and that sat within developer advocacy. And we tried to assign certain maintainers to certain developer advocates or DAs, so or volunteer mentors based on their areas of expertise. This is kind of like if you're familiar with sales, it's like an account manager model. Like each project would have their own dedicated point of contact who is hopefully an expert within their particular language or area or whatnot. Um, and I think our main challenge here was one, we had to make sure that these points of contact were still talking to each other. Uh, we wanted to make sure they're surfacing pain points so that we could learn if something is a problem for one maintainer, it actually was for multiple ones and should be escalated more. And we wanted them to be sharing knowledge more. And so I would say that this worked out in some ways and not so much in other ways, maybe partially because of the way we went about it. So like I mentioned earlier, we had some who were with DAs, with DevRel, and we had some who were just like product team, like volunteer mentors, essentially. And so DevRel and DA, because this is their job, they knew how to be literally, you know, an advocate for their pain points. And because as a team, we're always needing to be prepared for what's coming down the line, generally we had a pretty good visibility of sort of what's happening with Stripe and we could help them figure out a little bit like what should they work on next or is there something big coming down the line they need to worry about. Um, on the flip side, volunteer mentors were really good about the fact that they were in their specific product team so they had great subject matter expertise. They could answer like a question about billing like in a second because they worked on it and they know how it works. Um, and they could also directly monitor uh, the progress of any feedback, which is always hard within a company, right? That feedback loop falls somewhere along the line. You tell somebody something, does it actually go anywhere? We don't know. Um, but while these product, uh, product team volunteers had really great subject matter expertise, they didn't have DevRel expertise which we just, I think, failed in realizing that DevRel is also a subject matter that you need expertise in. And so I think if we could go back, we would have given them a little bit more structure and maybe just a crash course in how to literally be a developer advocate. You know, how do you advocate for their pain points? How do you check in on their project management? How do you provide support on like maybe what they should be doing next? And around, I think, maybe 2022, we kind of wound down the mentorship program and just another aspect of why we had to wind this down was we just didn't have as many DAs anymore because we lost a team member. We lost a lot of team members in 2022. So kind of the state that we're at now that we're also still trying to figure out is can we move towards something that's kind of like one intake? You know, as I mentioned earlier, some people DM'd us, some people pinged us on Discord, we even still had a forum going, sometimes even email. Um, so like due to a convergence of factors at Stripe, we kind of ended up settling on Discord and that's, this I have to say is just very much what worked for us. That's just where a lot of them tended to talk to us. Not everybody still is on Discord and we try to remember that, but that had the benefit of sort of dispersing the taking on of responsibilities because we could have a ton of people in there and as long as somebody was making sure that somebody got answered by somebody within some reasonable amount of time, it was working. So to be honest, we're still working this out. Um, we don't want it to be something as formal as like on call or like assigned responders, but we want to make sure that we're still getting their questions answered. Cool. So moving right along with more rapid fire tactics, um, budget renewal can be your friend. It's basically a forcing function uh, for uh, legitimizing your sponsorship program, but also is an opportunity for you to ask for more money on a regular cadence uh, to talk upwards, uh, managing outwards, uh, and sharing like the ROI of your program thus far, which is hopefully uh, evidence for you to expand it to more uh, projects going forward. Uh, and we've heard this being a very uh, critical moment in time from our peer companies uh, when looking into um, how they've used it. We've even heard stories from uh, another OSPO who 
got creative with this process. And towards the end of the year, uh, there was, I think, a marketing team that was looking to do some spend uh, to meet, to fill up their budget um, before the end of the year. Uh, and they got creative and sponsored an open source foundation or team using that marketing budget. Um, so yeah, and uh, basically the OSPO can function uh, in this middle ground of figuring out how to, to map money to uh, maintainers in need. So a lot of the work of running an open source sponsorship program is actually just operations, it's admin, it takes a lot of your time, and the best thing that we learned here was treat your sponsorship platforms like regular vendors. You know, get them in the system. Um, there's no reason for them to have a different money flow just because it's money being spent in a different way. And the reason this helps is because it legitimizes what you're doing in the eyes of the company. You know, onboard your sponsorship platforms through the normal vendor processes, even though it can be often very painful. I can talk about that a lot. Uh, but it allows your finance orgs to engage with you on the terms that they're familiar with. You know, they understand purchase orders, they understand invoicing, they have the flow that everything goes through. But this also allows you to have regular budget review, like we talked about, uh, to get those reports and visibility into your expenses. And there's also just less month to month operational burden for you, even if it takes a lot more to set it up upfront. Um, for example, you might be submitting expenses every month. At one point, we had somebody submitting, submitting expense reports for like five figures every month that always got kicked back by the team being like, what is this? <laughs> what are you trying to do with your P card? Um, so for us personally, we use GitHub sponsors. GitHub has worked really well for us and it's a great resource for companies because it does invoice billing, which is very, very key for finance teams. It tells them what you're spending this money on in a way they understand. And it has typical procedures like purchase orders. If your company's at a point of needing to do POs, I'm sorry, so are we. But if you're not at that point yet, it still has all of these other things because these are things that your procurement team, your accounts payable, they will understand how this works. And I wanna emphasize with all of this that while this is where we're at now, do what works for you at your stage. You know, P-Card works totally well at the beginning for sure, but remember that this might not scale with your program and just remember to revisit it regularly as you do with all of the other processes within your open source program sponsorship. Just make sure to go down a route that legitimizes your goals because it will just make you so, your life so much easier down the road. Yeah, I just wanna mention that without uh, establishing these procurement vendor onboarding, we could never have run the bring your own budget pillar of our program uh, because we want to attribute those sponsorships to different cost centers in our org and running it off a of P card just wouldn't work that way. So it really unblocked uh, the growth of our program just by doing that simple administrative task of onboarding a vendor. Uh, and we've heard um, from other companies that that has done the same thing for them. Um, for us, yeah, GitHub was a major partner there. Uh, we, we saw how great it was for individuals, um, but also with par in partnership with Open Collective, it can be great for teams too. Open Collective is another platform we use for a few sponsorships, and we tended to let maintainers pick uh, between these, depending on if they were an individual maintainer or a team, really like the needs of their team and how they want to split up expenses uh, uh, and the money coming in there. Um, we also had one sponsorship through Patreon, which is a, uh, because the maintainer wasn't, was in a country that wasn't supported by these platforms. And so this is just a reminder that uh, open source is global. In fact, when we looked into uh, our last, looked into it recently, we were sponsoring something like 13 maintainers across uh, 11 or so projects, something like this. Uh, and it, they were in 11 countries. So. Uh, because we're on the internet, right? Uh, this is a global problem of moving money to these folks. So we ended up with these three platforms and they've work, worked really well for us, but more importantly, they've worked well for the maintainers we're sponsoring. But it's not just those three platforms, right? Like the open source economy is growing and there's starting to be more platforms, services, companies cropping up that help unblock uh, this problem. And I think more importantly, a lot of these companies are looking for other companies to take advantage of their services to unblock their business needs in the same way we're trying to do internally at Stripe. So hopefully we move in a few, towards a future where many aspects of the open source economy is just the software economy. Uh, we use certain services to 
contract through open source, certain services to do bug bounties, certain services to do sponsorship, uh, and hopefully we, uh, platforms like this grow to meet the needs of everything in the software economy. Yeah, and so we've kind of covered a lot of these different ways that you can support uh, your maintainers. And to be clear, money is king. That is what they have told us all it would be most useful to them. But we wanna, wanted to end this talk on a hopeful, like forward-thinking note. So there's a lot of different additional ways for impact that we wanted to think about, and we'd love to hear more ideas from you. But for example, like healthcare, at least in the US, I realize now that we're in Canada, but at least in the US, it is very difficult to do as an individual who's not employed by a corporation that has a group plan with somebody. Open Source Collective, if you actually Google this, is doing a really cool thing with this around how they can help do these sort of employment, payroll benefits things. Um, other things that you could think about is, do you have a lot of experience doing product management or project management? Because maybe you could help your maintainers sort through tickets to prioritize or figure out time commitments because a lot of the times an engineer will start an open source project to fix the problem, that's what engineers do, but they did not sign up to be a PM. They did not sign up to suddenly manage an entire product that now has people asking them for you know, features to fix all these things, they wanna do different things with it, so you could potentially help with that. Um, you know, are you in a different country or do you sort of have other subject matter expertise on something legal or financial? You know, you can't give, don't, don't give like official financial advice, but you could probably give a little bit of guidance on this and especially at Stripe, like just because of the people who work here are very interested in financial systems. A lot of them are familiar with how money flows work, with how financial systems work uh, that might be very opaque to others in a different country. So, you know, share the knowledge that you have. Um, another thing that we've thought about is sharing in-kind infrastructure. You know, you probably have a lot of processes set up for testing, for code quality, for CI, for translations maybe, platforms for documentation. If you already have maybe a subscription or some tooling set up, can you share this with them as an arm of your team? How can you extend these team resources to them so they can be as efficient as the people that you know, you're fully, um, fully hiring? And anything else, like these are just a couple things that we thought of that you could potentially offer on top of your sponsorships. We highly encourage you to talk to your maintainers and just ask them how can you sponsor them and support them the best in the hope and the dream together that you know we can build the future of sustainable open source. Yeah, one random idea there that just came to mind was that uh, one of our maintainers also was running businesses on Stripe and he was interested in uh, discussing uh, basically like cost saving exercises through our platform. And so that could be like an interesting way, like use the leverages of, leverage of your business uh, to help the maintainers out in the ways that they need. Um, but yeah, thanks for attending our talk. Love to answer any questions that you have. Uh, and yeah, please come up and chat with us afterwards too, uh, if you want. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to repeat the question? For yeah, repeating the question. Concrete examples about how we measure ROI uh, in order to make it easier for us to pitch upwards uh, and ask for money for a sponsor program. Uh, the ones that have worked for us, the first case was measuring business growth. For us, we are an API platform, so when people use our platform, um, we can measure the dollars that are attached to those various uh, API calls, uh, if you're familiar. Um, and then we can measure the actual ROI of using the various um, 
for our users measuring the various open source projects that we're investing in. So we just look at the analytics of those users using the projects that we've sponsored, and then we correlate that back to dollars we've earned off of those users. Um, another way you could look at that is like, hey, there's like how many users are using those projects? And then look at the amount of money those users are making you on a business, and you can correlate it that way. Um, we're also looking at things like, we have a rough estimate about how much engineering hours you should invest in to save on AWS costs. So let's say like, hey, like if you can spend one hour here and save five hours per month of AWS costs, you should like do that instantly. Uh, we have like recommendations for engineers that way. And so you can roughly correlate like cost savings uh, on your infrastructure side with time spent on the engineering side. And, and so for us, we've established a program to let teams say, hey, we think that like fixing or investing in this open source dependency could save us on aggregate like 40 engineering hours per month. And so we can see like roughly how much cost that will save um, going forward. Now with that one, that leads to less of a reoccurring nature because once you fix those problems, potentially there's uh, less cost to be saved. Or the other way around uh, with the ROI investment for tracking revenue growth, uh, that ideally like will last forever because those projects can like grow uh, indefinitely. Um, so the cost saving one potentially is more attuned to sort of an open source grant, like give the money, make sure that this these particular problems that we're facing uh, get solved because we know that that will lead to the amount of the cost saving uh, in engineering hours that we are um, hoping to fix. And then the other one that's come to mind for us is um, unblocking uh, sales opportunities. So we've heard uh, you could like, if you're like in a sales driven company, then unblocking particular sales uh, cycles um, could be massively advantageous. Just helping land one sale in a year could be enough to like, you know, fund your open source sponsorship program, um, depending on the size of sales your company makes. And so, uh, especially in a software company like Stripe, uh, figuring out how to get involved in those projects and see what things are missing. Like maybe a user uh, needs a particular mobile SDK that is missing in your uh, supply, software supply chain, if you will, uh, figuring out how to unblock that with open source solutions, building trust there, saying like, hey, we don't have this solution internally, but we have direct rela relationships with these maintainers that have built this third party solution. Uh, and we basically are vouching for it as a safe solution for integrating with your platform. Um, and that could be enough to like unblock the trust they're needing to land a sale like that. Those are things that uh, we think about day to day. Um, but then again, uh, because we want to be a platform, uh, we, we like to think about like other teams deciding what ROI means to them too. Um, we're gonna come up with ROI models for ourselves to try and scale the program internally, but we want other teams to tell us like, hey, this is what ROI means for us. We care a lot about this number growing or uh, reaching more of this type of user or something like that. And so they can tell us how to measure that success for them. It's almost lunchtime. At least that's what my stomach tells me. <laughs> but feel free cool. to come up and say hi. Thank you. Yeah.